It's still hard to process what happened on this night 20 years ago. For the survivors of the Bali bombings, the scars run deep. For the families who lost loved ones, the pain will never go away. Oh, you just have to be tough about it. I break down at times still. And um, you just have to live with it now. Twenty years on, Lee Harrison still struggles with the loss of his older sister Nicole, murdered when two terrorist bombs ripped through Bali. So Lee, is it tough coming back here? Yeah, always. Um, especially when you see her name up there and you know that your name could have been there too. Lee survived the bomb blasts and comes back to find his sister's name on the memorial now built on the site of where it happened. Up there she is. Number 36? Yeah. I always miss you, Nikki. I love you forever. Travelling with Lee, his surviving sister Cherie, who wasn't here when it happened, but has joined Lee in Bali to speak for the first time ever about what they've been through. It's harder to come back here with Lee than it is um, with anyone else, yeah. I just see him recount over in his mind what he went through that night. Paddy's bar used to stand on that corner over there. Now it's a construction site. Diagonally across the road was the Sari Club. It's still a vacant block of land behind that corrugated iron fence. 20 years ago, these were the nightclubs to go to, and on any given night, they were packed with young tourists having fun. Guys, girls, football teams, it was a night that was going to be remembered forever. Phil Britton was in the Sari Club with a group of mates from a Perth footy team that night. Phil was 22 and remembers he was a bit drunk and heading for the toilet when he hears a noise. I remember thinking, nah, what, what's that? It can't be. Um, later on, I realised that that was the backpack bomb that, was, that went off in Paddy's. At about 11 o'clock that night, a suicide bomber walks into Paddy's bar and blows himself up, sending scores of people running onto the street. Seconds later, a white minivan packed with explosives is detonated by a second suicide bomber right here in front of the Sari Club. Bang! I was blown up by over 900 kilos of explosives in a minivan no more than 20 metres from where I was. That is where the life uh, that night went from having the time of my life to fighting for my life. Me and Nikki were sitting about where that um, bamboo hut is. We can see the top of it. Moments before the blast ripped through the Sari Club, Lee, like Phil Britton, got up to go to the toilet at the back of the bar, something that also saved his life. And I got blown to the back right hand side and I got out through the stairs up that way and across the roof. Into and the, the building next door. door. Yeah. Paddy's bar was there, there was people, that was ablaze, there was people there, and the Sari Club was to my left and you know it was it was just chaos. Sydney man Eric DeHart was returning to the Sari Club after walking a mate back to their hotel when the bombs went off. It was um, fire over there, fire here, and people sort of running backwards and forwards. A lot of people without clothes at this stage and bleeding and having shrapnel wounds everywhere. And it was, you know, it was chaos. And obviously you went into the Sari Club to help others. It was on fire. That was heroic. I don't know for sure how many times I went in or how many people I grabbed. I remember once I saw someone lying on the ground and I went to pick it up and I, an arm, I come away with an arm and I, I dropped it and it kind of uh, frightened me and I looked around and tried to find someone else I could help. In the middle of the blast, Phil Britton says it was like time stood still. I just remember tumbling in the air and then I just feel this, this pain. I'm, I've hit this wall which I, I believe to be a back bar or a wall or something and um, I'm I'm curled up on the floor and I've got all this roofing and I've got bodies all over me. The sheer magnitude of what happened here can't be underestimated. 202 people killed, 
88 Australians, dozens more injured. And this wasn't an accident, this was terrorism. And you can't appreciate the level of suffering that still exists until you speak to the survivors. Walls of fire just start appeal, appearing. They're just, fire is starting to appear from everywhere. Thatched roofs falling. I can hear alcohol bottles popping. And as my hearing's starting to come back, I start to hear the worst sound in the world, which is like a horror movie. And I'm just listening to men and women screaming, like high-pitched screams. Eric DeHart heard the screams for help as well. He remembers seeing a group of girls trapped behind a portion of the ceiling which collapsed. It was a thatched roof and it was on fire. And I knew um, that I'd be flat out making it across once, let alone going over and back three times. So um, thankfully, I guess my, my head overruled my heart and I had to turn my back on them. And I went outside and I just sat down in the gutter and with my hand my head in my hand and um, I cried. I don't think anyone would say that you didn't make the right decision there. Oh look, yeah, you keep telling yourself, yeah, you made the right decision, yeah, but you make decisions in an event like that, that you have to live with for the rest of your life. Um, and the cold light heart of day, I let these girls down and I let their families down because I didn't even try. I know I've got to say to myself that I know I wouldn't have survived it myself. But it's still a hard cross to bear. In the panic, Lee says he scrambled up a staircase at the back of the club onto the roof and then had to jump a metre onto the building next door. And something horrible happened before you jumped, didn't it? Yeah, a person jumped before me. He landed on the wall on his chest and then he landed on his back. And... Um, he uh, fell down between the buildings. Between the two walls. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he survived or not. And that's when I jumped across and made it and, and jumped over on the other side. On the other side, there was alleyway and jumped down in there. Looking at the footage of the aftermath, it's hard to believe anyone survived. Cherie says she still can't watch it without wondering where her sister and brother were as the building is consumed by flames. I can't stand looking at the footage. It's in your mind, you don't know, is she still alive, but can't get help, and is she just, or has she died instantly? That's what goes through your mind, and you think of Lee and how young he was and trying to get out. Lying near the bar, Phil Britton remembers seeing a space, one piece of wall that wasn't on fire, and he goes for it. I jump as high as I can, and I remember getting my fingertips on this wall. As I go to pull myself up, I slip and I fall and I tumble into the fire. When Lee makes it onto the street, he can see the front of the nightclub. The first thought is, where's Nicole and yeah. what can I do? You know, I saw the front of the place and I was like, as soon as I saw her, I was like, she's gone. Just, I knew, she knew that straight away. Fire's starting to creep in and lick my back. I get up on this wall, I jump as high as I can the second time. And as I'm about to pull myself up, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I'm out, I'm, I'm, I'm escaping. And then I feel hands grab my shoulders and hands grab my hair. And I'm being pulled down by all these other people using me as a ladder to get out of this burning inferno. After two attempts to escape, Phil Britton admits he almost gave up, but summoned the strength for one last go. I looked at that wall, I launched like a rocket. I don't even remember how I got out, to be honest. I just remember being sat on the wall I look back, the fire, the craziness, I look over the wall, I start climbing over the neighbouring roof and it wasn't until I got to the very top of the neighbouring roof with all the roof tiles blown off, all the battens, that uh, I felt the significance of my burns at that point. Someone took this photo of Phil, injured and covered in blood, trying to escape on the neighbouring roof. He had burns to 60% of his body and would probably have died if he wasn't airlifted back to Australia. The injuries were horrendous. The burns were just unbelievable burns. The sort of burns that come out of mass explosions and warfare and the traumatic injuries, the uh, traumatic amputations and the impalements and so on that came down were just horrendous. 
Dr. Len Nataris was in charge of the Darwin Hospital, the closest point to bring the victims home. I do expect the human tragedy of this to be what uh, arrests uh, most heavily. Just 26 hours after the bombings, the first of 61 evacuees arrived in RAAF planes before being moved on to other burns units around the country. Sadly, one person passed away on the flight coming down um, and one person sadly passed away in the intensive care as we tried desperately to resuscitate them. Apart from those two, everybody else survived and uh, the, uh, uh, the seamless, um, the seamless uh, repatriation of 55 Burns patients around the country, as I said, has become textbook. I, I had over 40 blood transfusions in my time in hospital. I had to learn to walk again. And many times during my recovery, I actually wish I died. Burns is the worst injury you could ever imagine. You wouldn't wish it, wish it on your worst enemy. Rightfully proud of the work he and the staff at the Darwin Hospital did, Dr Nataris can't deny the toll it took on him. It was and is um, a, a very confronting circumstance. We had a job to do and we got on with it. A day doesn't go past, uh, Chris, that I don't think of those victims. Or at, um, Yes, it, it was confronting. Excuse me, <laughs> just for a moment. Surviving with just some cuts and bruises, Lee flew home three days after the blasts, but it took much longer for his family to find his sister, Nicole. Um, it was a good two weeks. We had to uh, wait in for DNA um, testing, so they came to the house and took DNA off um, mum and dad and some things in Nicole's bedroom, hairbrushes and stuff like that, and, um, and my older brother. And... Um, yeah, there was a lot of people in hospitals that were unrecognisable. Were you angry that this had happened? Yeah, I had a lot of anger for a very long time. I think I still do. I wouldn't be lying if I said that in the 20 years, I haven't thought about it every single day. Like, it, it's changed my family's life forever. Kelly Devlin's sister Stacey and her brother-in-law Justin and Justin's brother Aaron were killed in the Sari Club. This was the last ever photo of them, taken by a stranger just hours before the bombs went off. It, it depicts them as they, as they were. They were just <laughs> yeah. sitting at the bar, having a nice time, just relaxed casual. and enjoying their holiday. So, yeah. yeah. Family friend Richard Woodhams was with the group that night in Bali but left the club minutes before the bomb exploded. He remembers Aaron telling him a secret earlier that evening. I'm telling you that Stacey was about 12 weeks pregnant. Eight. Eight weeks pregnant. So it looks surprised when they tell you. Their little baby was never considered a, an official number of the, um, the bombing statistics. So they say there was 88 Australians that died, but there was really 89. As being a survivor, tell people that being a survivor is a life sentence. Um, you know, just like the families, the families, every time there's a birthday or there's Christmas or whatever, there's a gap, there's a hole where their sons should be and, or their daughters and, and that. But, you know, with me, you've got to live it. Every year, you've got to relive it. Eric DeHart lives in Sydney's eastern suburbs. Every October 12, he goes at dawn to the memorial built there to remember those who died. 20 of them from this area alone. Six were mates of Eric's, and what makes it worse for him is the sense of outrage at what happened to those responsible for this horror. These guys killed 202 people, and I don't know how many other deaths have been caused since that night by the losses incurred. There's only the bombers got shot, the guys that planned it, the bomb makers, they're all out of jail. I mean, what kind of justice is that? It must be, it stings enough for me, so it must be really, really hard for people who've lost sons and daughters there, and husbands or wives. What really angers the victims, families and friends is the fact that Indonesian authorities are considering releasing Bali bomb maker Umar Patek after serving little more than half of his 20 year sentence at the time of this year's anniversary. Him shooting should be dead, should have been a long time ago. And then when he gets let out, if he gets let out, just give me two minutes alone with him in a room. <laughs> It just makes me so angry that um, they, they fought for 10 years to find him and then they found him and then they put him away for 20 years and he's only going to get 10 years. He killed 203 people, not 202, 203 people. And 
he should get a, a, year, a, a year for every one of those lives, minimum. I remember after, when Bali happened, I mean, Australian people, we raised in excess of $14 million for the Indonesians, for Bali people, for the hospital. The Denpasar Hospital's been virtually rebuilt with Australian money. And yet they still go on like that, like we're the bad guys. In spite of what happened to him, Lee Harrison has come to love Bali. He's visited many times to go surfing. And I remember um, when the plane left, I said to myself, I'm never coming to this place ever again. <laughs> and now I love coming to this place. Mm. And sometimes we come once or twice a year. Uh, I have a deep love and hate for the same place. All of the survivors we've spoken to say they've struggled physically and psychologically. Some still so traumatised they pulled out of doing interviews with us. And yet others say eventually they found a sense of purpose out of what happened to them here in Bali. I actually spiralled out of control, you know, depression, drugs, alcohol, um, you know, life wasn't good. Maybe on the surface or uh, from other people's point of view, I was doing OK, but internally I was falling apart. Phil Britton says his grandmother convinced him to talk about what happened at her local Lions Club. It was that moment that really made me, uh, I guess, push me to share my story, push me to unbottle what I'd been through. And, you know, in, the, in my mind, I'm thinking maybe this is why I survived. Maybe this is why I'm here, you know. Maybe if, you know, I survived to tell the story or I f survived to tell the way that, I, that got, I got out. And if I can inspire these people, maybe I can help others. Just why? While Lee and his sister Sheree are spending the anniversary at home in Perth, they say it's important to pay their respects at the memorial. Do you feel at all closer to Nicole being here? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I don't, um, I feel closer visiting her here than where she is laying in rest. How will you remember 20 years on? I'll probably go down, the last few years I've been going down at 5.30 in the morning and just standing at the, at Dolphins Point and saying, uh, having a brief word with the boys and you know, asking them if they're, if they're happy with what I've done and how I've tried to keep their memories alive and be there to show the terrorists too that while they may have killed us, they haven't beaten us. Anymore.